Je voudrais euh, commencer en, en remerciant, en remerciant, en saluant brièvement l'initiative de cette exposition sur les Tchèques dans la Grande Guerre, que vous pouvez voir donc euh, dans le couloir, on peut dire, dans le hall, comment ça s'appelle cet espace Bon, c'est pas grave, à côté. <rire> Et euh, donc je voudrais d'abord remercier évidemment les commissaires, euh, qui sont les historiens Étienne Boissery et Yerji Hutechka, qui est ici, de l'université de Hradec Králové, et puis aussi, évidemment, l'équipe organisatrice de la BULAC. Merci aussi à monsieur, dès que je me tourne, on ne m'entend plus, merci à monsieur Kikal d'être aussi parmi nous ce soir. Alors, moi, je représente euh, au premier titre, euh, vous dire, le Centre de recherche Europe Asie, qui est euh, engagé dans cette euh, action, et dans le cadre duquel notre collègue Étienne Boisserie, ici présent, a mené depuis à peu près trois ans un programme de recherche, euh, disons, ambitieux sur l'Europe médiane dans la Première Guerre mondiale. C'est un programme transnational où la dimension de coopération scientifique entre les chercheurs européens a été fortement privilégiée, comme on a pu le voir à travers les colloques, les, les ateliers qu'il a, qu a organisés, etc. Bon, Aujourd'hui, c'est un contexte national, j'ose prononcer ce mot, qu'Étienne et ses collaborateurs ont décidé de mettre à l'honneur en se focalisant sur les Tchèques au long de ces années de guerre, dont bien des aspects restent mal connu, voire inconnu. On s'en apercevra sans tarder, en parcourant l'exposition, vous l'avez peut-être déjà fait, euh, cette histoire singulière doit toutefois être inscrite dans l'histoire de l'Europe centrale, de l'Europe tout court, et même évidemment de, du monde. Et cette inscription euh, forme un fil conducteur majeur et indispensable de l'exposition qui nous est présentée. Nous, nous célébrons en ce moment, euh, parmi les Tchèques, le centenaire d'un État qui n'est plus, la Tchécoslovaquie, euh, mais qui a laissé une empreinte profonde dans l'histoire de l'Europe centrale au siècle passé. Donc je termine donc en changeant de casquette et en remerciant à nouveau les concepteurs et organisateurs de cette exposition, cette fois-ci au nom des, des études tchèques de l'INALCO. Euh, pour nous, euh, cette exposition marque un jalon décisif des célébrations en cours, célébrations du centenaire de la création de la Tchécoslovaquie. Euh, voilà, merci de votre attention. Je passe la parole à Étienne. Merci beaucoup. Euh, alors, je vais, je vais être obligé de commencer, euh, moi aussi, par des remerciements, avec euh, ce petit inconvénient pour ce qui me concerne, que, évidemment, pour un tel, pour organiser euh, une chose telle que cette exposition, euh, il, il convient de remercier beaucoup de gens, parce que beaucoup de gens ont participé à la possibilité que cette exposition existe. Et donc, pour ce genre de circonstances, évidemment, la liste de remerciements est affreusement longue. Je vous prie de m'en excuser par avance, mais c'est important euh, pour moi et pour eux aussi que vous sachiez qu'ils ont pris part à, à enfin qu'ils ont permis l'aboutissement de cette exposition. Alors si je m'en tiens à l'ordre chronologique, approximatif, euh, mes premiers remerciements vont à Benjamin Guichard qui est le directeur scientifique de la Bulac à qui j'avais euh, soumis euh, l'idée et qui a répondu très positivement à cette idée euh, je me rappelle très précisément le lieu et le moment c'était euh, au même endroit dont je ne me rappelle jamais le nom euh, à l'occasion de l'exposition la, de la, de sur le patrimoine soviétique euh, la mémoire du patrimoine soviétique en France dont vous avez peut-être souvenir Évidemment, je remercie le directeur de la Bulac, Marie-Lise Sagouria, d'avoir accepté également cette idée. Et puis, tout particulièrement, l'équipe des mille pages du pôle médiation, qui n'est pas là parce qu'il travaille à la Bulac en ce moment. Et puis, l'équipe de l'action culturelle dans la construction et le travail de longue haleine qu'a représenté cette exposition. Je suis particulièrement reconnaissant à Juliette Pinson, qui le voit depuis le début, et à Caroline Boiteux pour leur sang-froid ce qu'il en fallait, pour leur, jeu, leur très judicieux conseil et surtout pour leur très grande disponibilité. Voilà, ce sont deux personnes qui ont été absolument décisives dans la réalisation de ce travail. Et puis pour la conception et la réalisation des panneaux, euh, je suis très reconnaissant à Emmanuel Garcia d'avoir travaillé très vite et très bien dans des conditions qui n'étaient pas très faciles pour elle. Euh, mais ce travail intense a toujours été plaisant au cours des, des dernières semaines. Alors, puisque nous sommes dans l'autocongratulation, je continue. Je remercie beaucoup Catherine Servant, à mon tour, euh, à la fois en tant que responsable des études tchèques, mais aussi en tant que, que directrice du CREE, pour le soutien et la confiance dont elle m'a manifesté euh, 
qu'elle m'a manifesté en permanence et puis l'enthousiasme qu'elle a manifesté à chaque étape du projet. Et puis j'associe évidemment Ilona Sanzel Ponyavitchova qui est lectrice de Tchèque, qui est doctorante également au CREU et qui est aussi beaucoup plus que ça dans l'équipe dans l'équipe des études tchèques et sur l'aide de laquelle j'ai toujours pu compter lorsque je l'ai sollicité et aide très efficace de sa part. Et puis bien entendu, le travail de présélection iconographique et tout le, le, le pré-choix qui a été fait pour organiser cette exposition en fonction d'une trame qui avait, été, qui avait été élaborée a été assurée depuis, depuis la République tchèque par Jerzy Utechka, euh, qui a mobilisé trois institutions pour ce faire, le musée régional de Brno, le musée ethnographique d'Olomouts et euh, le musée de Bohème oriental de Radetz Kralové afin que nous puissions disposer d'un vaste choix iconographique et évidemment dans ce cas-là le plus dur c'est pas tellement celle qu'on a finalement choisie c'est celle on a été, auquel on a été obligé de renoncer vous imaginez bien. Et puis à Prague c'est Thomas Kikal qui a entrepris un très grand travail de sélection du, du riche fonds de l'Institut d'Histoire Militaire fonds dont il a la charge et Institut d'Histoire Militaire qui présente la particularité d'être la grande institution qui a succédé il y a maintenant assez longtemps à l'institution qui était consacré à la conservation des fonds de la Grande Guerre, c'est-à-dire ce qu'on ce qu appelait le mémorial de la résistance et qu'on a ensuite appelé le mémorial de la libération et qui est devenu ensuite l'Institut d'Histoire Militaire et qui a récupéré ses fonds. Et puis très rapidement, je voudrais remercier alors, deux personnes euh, je considère en fait voilà, importante, même si ces deux personnes de la Bulac euh, n'ont pas pris part directe à la préparation de ce travail. Elles y ont joué un rôle important dans la maturation. Euh, D'abord Soline Lossuchet, euh, qui est aujourd'hui responsable adjointe du développement des collections, et Alexandre Hassanovic, qui était responsable de ce pôle lorsque j'ai longuement travaillé à la Bulac pour préparer mon livre sur les tchèques. La première parce que j'ai toujours conservé à l'esprit nos conversations sur la nécessité de mettre en valeur le fonds de tchèque de la Bulac et puis le second pour le plaisir des discussions sur ces collections tchèques de la Bulac, le grand intérêt qu'il y portait avant de partir prendre des responsabilités dans un établissement pas très, pas très loin d'ici. Alors, l'idée initiale, euh, c'était euh, de présenter la riche collection de la Bulac sur euh, le sujet de la Première Guerre mondiale, qui est une collection en grande partie issue des, des fonds de la, de la Biulo, mais qui a été euh, enrichie euh, depuis euh, régulièrement. Et c'est l'objet de l'exposition euh, euh, de certains ouvrages euh, du fond euh, qui se tient au Ré de Jardin et que nous aurons l'occasion d'aller voir après la, la, la visite de l'exposition de principale qui est là. Donc on pourra aller à la Bulac et... Euh, J'évoquerai un certain nombre de points pour cette exposition des ouvrages. Et puis, le deuxième objectif, c'était de permettre de mettre en valeur, de toucher du doigt d'une manière abordable et autant que possible séduisante. Alors évidemment, il s'agit de la guerre, donc la, la séduction est limitée, mais autant que possible séduisante, quelques éléments des évolutions de recherche au cours des dernières années. Tenant compte du fait que le récit de guerre en Tchécoslovaquie s'est principalement construit immédiatement après la guerre sur le mode héroïque de la libération, que c'est l'action qui a été privilégiée, c'est l'action extérieure et l'action politique et militaire extérieure, et que sous des formes différentes, ces deux dimensions sont restées dominantes. Et désormais, il est entendu que la Grande Guerre en Autriche comme ailleurs, c'est aussi et surtout un moment d'intense mobilisation de l'ensemble des couches de la société en faveur de l'effort de guerre, que c'est une mobilisation de l'arrière par laquelle euh, il s'agit d'exacerber le patriotisme, d'accompagner le soldat dans son euh, combat et de donner les moyens à l'État de tenir face à la menace extérieure et face à l'adversaire. La guerre, c'est aussi un temps de transformation profonde de l'organisation économique, du monde du travail, mais aussi des relations familiales, du rôle des différentes institutions, et notamment de l'école, qui devient le haut lieu d'expression de ce patriotisme. Et ce sont ces différents éléments que nous avons essayé de mettre en valeur dans cette exposition au travers de ces 36 panneaux qui reprennent quatre grands champs thématiques d'études avec une progression approximativement chronologique. Voilà le, le, le sens, l'idée générale de, de l'exposition. Évidemment, je détaillerai un petit peu plus lorsqu'on aura l'occasion de la visiter. Et pour euh, ma part, euh, les, les remerciements et le propos introductif s'arrêtent là. Et je vous laisse entre les mains de Catherine Servant, Yerji Utechka et Thomas Kikal. Voilà. 
Alors, quelques mots de présentation de nos invités. D'abord, je vais donner la parole à M. Hutechka, je pense, oui, qui est directeur du département d'histoire de l'Université de Granada Skralove, où il enseigne depuis dix ans. Il s'est d'abord spécialisé dans les conflits du, 20e, du 19e siècle, pardon, en particulier aux États-Unis. Et son travail sur la guerre civile américaine a été publié aux éditions Lidoven au Véné en 2008. Puis il est revenu vers des thématiques plus européennes avec une longue étude consacrée à la guerre et aux sociétés en Europe au XIXe siècle. Et il y a deux ans, il a publié un travail fondamental intitulé « Les hommes contre le feu » dans lequel il est le premier dans l'historiographie tchèque à s'abstraire du débat centenaire sur la loyauté, des loyautés des soldats tchèques. Voilà, je crois qu'on peut signaler aussi qu'il a publié un article en anglais dans la revue des études slaves euh, récemment, l'année dernière intitulée euh, « Ressembler à des hommes ». Voilà. Better? Okay. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> so again, I apologize for speaking in English. Uh, I hope you won't take it as an offense. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Bilak and Etienne and everyone who participated in preparing this amazing exhibition. Uh, I was really, I'm really happy that I could be a small part of it and I could contribute contribute a little bit uh, to the result. You can see down the hallway, I think it's a, an amazing exhibition that probably best summarizes from, from what I've seen, one of the best summaries of Czech experience uh, during the Great War. Uh, I've seen in the past four years, and believe me, I have seen plenty of them in the past four years. Uh, uh, I was asked to contribute a little bit with some uh, contextual uh, speech or uh, introduction. So I came with the idea that I would provide uh, context to some of those pictures that are out there that uh, are dealing with uh, those Czechs who actually didn't spend the war, most of it, in Bohemia, Moravia, or those parts of Silesia we still consider Czech. Uh, and those who served in the Austro-Hungarian military in, in, uh, uh, in combat, or not in combat, um, but on, the other, on all the fronts, from Galicia to northern Italy, to the uh, submarine and naval bases on the Adriatic Sea, all the way down to the Palestine, where you can find Czech soldiers fighting with some Austro-Hungarian units. Uh, of course, the best, the basic problem we always have with these guys who are on those photographs there are that we have some traditional idea or image of a Czech soldier uh, that is the notion of a Czech soldier as a deserter or uh, in the future member of the Czechoslovak legion which is actually something that happened to about 90,000 Czechs about Two-thirds of them actually, maybe more, being ex-POWs, ex-Austro-Hungarian soldiers. But the problem, of course, is what the remaining one million uh, Czech men who spoke Czech and who served in Austro-Hungarian army did uh, during the war. Uh, the solution to this problem actually is part of the mainstream image. We all know it. I think uh, we are all familiar with the great and wonderful novel, The Good Soldier Schweik, uh, that is the solution to the problem, because the, even in 1920s, most of the Czechos Czechoslovak nation just came up with the agreement that all the Czech soldiers were basically Schweiks, and they were the worst possible soldiers they could serve Austria-Hungary, sabotaging the war effort since day one of the Great War. And uh, it's very... Uh, of course, it's not very historical, but we have. It's very difficult to actually uh, analyze this problem, even if you go through the historical writings past, basically 100 years. It's always there. Most of the soldiers actually agreed that this was their own past, so they uh, re uh, rewrote their own memories in this in the same style, and. Uh, there's a big contrast, for example, between memories and diaries in this context. But again, 
probably not all that, not all of them were Schweigs. So we have 150,000 Czech Czech men, Czech speaking soldiers who died in a war, 200,000 plus who were who ended up invalids as invalids. Uh, state recognized and well it's uh, uh, after the war so someone had to fight and there was probably several hundred thousand of them and so the big question is how were how were they any different from uh, any other soldiers on the, any other fronts or in actually any other war and what actually influenced their loyalty was it different or was it the same uh, I can try, and that will be part of my speech here. It will very shortly summarize what actually was changing with the Czech soldiers during the war. Because if you if we look at the very beginning, the mobilization, and there's very nice photographs of uh, soldiers being mobilized uh, in the exhibition in 1914. I, my guess is they would, they were no different than any other group around Europe. There are some who were probably a little bit enthusiastic about the idea. Most of them were just indifferent. Plenty of them are anxious, pessimistic about the notion of being killed for some idea they don't care about. Uh, most of them were, were afraid, but no one was af almost no one was actually afraid enough or uh, negative about mobilization enough to not to report themselves to the mobilization center. So the army, which was actually fearing that there's going to be trouble with the Czechs. Well, they were surprised. Nothing happened. All the Czechs dutifully reported and dutifully uh, went uh, to battle, even some of them singing patriotic songs. Ironically, some of these songs became patriotic songs of the Czechoslovak Republic later on. So they were singing Denum of Mui, marching to the field for Austria-Hungary, until it wasn't banned later on. Uh, to, there's, a, anime, there's plenty of very typical sentences I can quote from diaries and letters, but probably the best ones are one soldier who said, or wrote in his diary, actually, everyone's going, so I have to go too. Uh, the social pressure was there, just everyone's going to war, everyone's going to war, I'm going to war as well. And another one added in his letter to his parents, everyone has to obey. Right? They were just used to obey orders and so they did uh, again or they were expecting short war so it helped and they were expecting sometimes even no war at all because this was like fifth mobil or fourth mobilization in past five years so that helped as well of course the war didn't end and uh, it turned out very ugly pretty quickly so uh, kind, some kind of disillusionment and depression sets in in 19, uh, late 1914 the army actually, in its search for uh, for scapegoats for the defeats that it suffered at the end of 1914, uh, ended up pretty quickly identifying the suspicious, uh, the suspect minorities, where the Czechs were always the, the most suspect, because probably because there were just most of them in those suspect minorities, and uh, when it combined with the huge casualties where we have to realize that the Austro-Hungarian army lost, before the end of 1914, it has lost one million men, uh, about 300,000 of them dead, and it has lost 400,000 more men in the first few months of 1915. It actually has lost three times of its peacetime complement during the first uh, 11 months of war. Uh, and uh, these casualties, of course, had very important effects on how the soldiers experienced their uh, duty because they, they were, the threat of losing lives were, was very serious. Their officers were usually dead after a few months or weeks, so new officers came very inexperienced, so more casualties came, as one of the soldiers remembered uh, at the end of 1914. We don't have any officers, and uh, mistakes often happen as a result these mistakes usually cost them their lives. So they kind of like have the feeling already in 1914 that this army is actually not very good at fighting a war, which uh, an added, added consequence for, uh, consequences came out of uh, actually don't have, not having enough supplies, not having enough food. It was the first winter of the war with an army that wasn't prepared for a winter fighting, so they didn't have clothes. 
uh, in Carpathians, so they froze to death often, very often. And this was kind of like the first uh, important setback in Czech soldiers' morale, which then, of course, brings plenty of problems, especially, and you may, you may know the moments where whole Czech regiments supposedly desert and go over to the Russians in the spring of 1915, sometimes according to the myth with the music playing and the flags flying and all that stuff. Of course, it never happened like that, but they just, they were captured, they gave up. They were too tired, too depressed, and too outnumbered, probably. And they didn't want to die on the battlefield. Uh, in fact, this caused the Austrian army to scapegoat them even more, so the Czechs became the prime suspects of everything. And uh, the army, the, the, uh, the image of disloyal Czechs was born in uh, early 1915, and they never got rid of it. Actually, it was taken out not only by the army authorities, because if you were a commander, you could always say, well, it was the Czech's fault, it was not my fault that I didn't win the battle. And they did, they did that a lot. And uh, it was taken up by uh, Czechoslovak National Council and its propaganda in Western Europe and all over the place. They were saying basically the same thing Austrians were saying about Czechs. Uh, and, but the Czech soldiers still served on in 1915 more or less, they're more or less stabilized. And during the war, they are kind of like, they're getting more and more disgruntled by the fact that no one actually believes they are fighting this war with some effort. They are very depressed by the fact they are under, they are seen as cowards, so they don't like the image at all. But they are still more or less loyal. Uh, on the other hand, there is another set of circumstances that is very difficult for them, especially the economic situation at home. That, and again, there's plenty of uh, panels in the exhibition about that. We have to realize that everything that's happening at home is influencing the soldiers at the front. So when they read or when they go on leave and see their families starving gradually during 1916 and especially 1917, they became they become really uh, demoralized that this is, this this state I have, I'm fighting for, for at, at first it doesn't believe me as a soldier, and second it's not able actually to support my family uh, and my children and my my uh, my wife who are dying actually at home. We have plenty of instances of soldiers who return depressed from leaves, who actually return sooner from their leaves just because they don't want to starve their family out. So they want to be fed at home, so they go back to their units, back to the front, even though they write in the same letter, for example, I don't want to go back there, but they still go because they have, basically they have to. Uh, and this makes their situation really complicated. And 1917 is a kind of like a breaking point, especially the reopening of parliament in May 1917 caused all the German-Austrian criticism and Hungarian criticism of Czech soldiers to go really public. So there were open debates in the parliament about Czechs being the Czechs being traitors and cowards. And of course, it's in the newspapers. Soldiers can read it. It's not very good for their morale and motivation to you know still fight on. Surprisingly, still most of them do. And uh, there are some important positive things that happened to them, especially closing down the Eastern Front, which looks like something that could end the war. Then successful offensive in uh, November 1917 and after the Battle of Caporetto, when actually the Austrian German armies sweep down the, uh, the Venetian plain, basically on a whole wave of rampage and pillaging and rape, they steal everything, eat everything. So they, for two months, they have something to eat, finally. Uh, but then, at the end of 1917, it's just gone. Everything's eaten and they have nothing, no supplies. So by the beginning of 1918, and with the economic situation in Austria just going downhill, the situation of the soldiers is even worse. Uh, you can We can see it in diaries and letters. Basically, the only thing they care about at the beginning of 1918 is food, food, lack of food, search for food, stealing food, not having food, or being hungry, and uh, whatever happens to them when they are hungry for a long time. The only other thing that appears there is mostly just peace, desire for peace. One of the one of the officers actually reported 
in early 1918 for the for his superiors that desire for peace is ever present in all units in all between, between all among all between all groups so german speaking soldiers hungarian speaking soldiers czech speaking soldiers everyone just wants peace and the, for him troubling for, for him the troubling thing was that they don't care about the nature of the peace anymore uh, for him, it was troubling. They don't care that Austria would win. <laughs> uh, from the point of view of the traditional idea of Czech soldier, they actually didn't care if Austria did win. Just if whatever would bring peace, that was it. And uh, the idea of peace was actually connected with things like uh, the reports of the successful German offensives on the Western Front in March 1918. That, if that could bring peace, why not? Then, when the offensive in June 1918 was prepared in Italy, they were anxious, they were afraid of you know, dying during combat, but still, there was some, there was sometimes, we can see some notion that finally, if this can bring peace, let's do it. Of course, it didn't, it was a disaster, actually a disaster that uh, can be subscribed with one keyword in soldiers', soldiers accounts, which is hell. The Battle of the Pia River is probably all, generally always described as the worst experience ever. And uh, of course, it was a disaster. And then, it basically, only then in July and August 1918, I, can, I would agree with the idea that Czech, Czech soldiers just mentally got mentally di divorced from the, from the war itself and from. Uh, from Austria-Hungary as well, because war and Austria-Hungary during 1918, late 1917, 1918, basically becomes the similar entity. They start to stop to you know make the difference, and after the Battle of the Piaf River, they just want this to be over. And of course, the depressing thing is they have no that they have no notion that there's going to be an end to this because there's going to be more battles of the Piaf River and because there were 11 battles of the Isonzo River, so this was the first one, there's gonna be 10 more. And, but they don't wanna take any part of this, they are just waiting for it to end. But they are waiting, so most of them are still in the ranks, being pa as passive as possible, avoiding service, avoiding anything, basically, because they are hungry. So they are just, again, searching for food. And, but still, they kind of like remain in the ranks waiting for for the army to be defeated and for the war to end from above. Even the Czechoslovak propaganda, which in 1918 is actually going, getting through to them, is received with some hope, with some notion of this, this is going to be some alternative ending. There's a hope that we can, you know, go home to some different country, but still most of them just, you know, hide the pamphlet, read it, hide the pamphlet or throw it away and uh, don't do anything about it. So it's very, it has very limited, limited effect and uh, only, it takes only the final offensive of the, of the, of the Italian army in late October 1918 that makes the army basically crumble and then in that moment, Czech soldiers finally kind of like go public with the, this, the, the disgruntled uh, attitude. And the first thing they want to go is to go home. They don't care where the, the, the home is going to be, if it's going to be in Austria, Hungary, or Czechoslovakia. They want to go home. And, big, and when, the moment they realize it's going to be Czechoslovakia, they are happy because Czechoslovakia is something that's not connected with war, hopefully. And this is something they can, you know, call their own country. So they, when they, for example, units of Austrian Hungary army, usually the the officers who had no idea what to do when the army was retreating, they let soldiers take a vote. And you can see that basically the units voted according to nationalities. The army was no longer there. The soldiers just felt to be a part of something else than the army or Austria Hungary. They were Austrians, Hungarians, or German, or Hungarians. Czechs, Slovenes, Croats, and they voted as nation group, nation groups. And uh, but sometimes uh, we've got this this feeling that they did this just they saw it as a quick ticket home. So this was secondary. In mo I would say even majority of them would do anything. They would vote to be Germans just to get home. 
uh, and uh, then of course the irony is when they came home they went to war to fight against their own ex German Austrian soldiers and the, and the, and the German speaking provinces of Bohemia and Moravia they went to fight in Slovakia for Slovakia against Hungarians and so on so the war actually didn't end for them for another almost a year but uh, they could know that in 1918 so that was my summary of Czech soldiers. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. On va passer la parole à Monsieur Tomáš Kikal, qui a été formé à l'Université Charles de Prague, qui a commencé à travailler à l'Institut d'Histoire Militaire de Prague en 2007. Et depuis 2012, il est chercheur au département d'Histoire et de Documentation de l'Institut, chargé de l'histoire de l'armée austro-hongroise au cours de la Grande Guerre et de l'armée tchécoslovaque dans la première décennie de la République. Voilà, il a tout, tout un tas de fonctions euh, dans le cadre de cet institut d'histoire militaire. Il est notamment responsable de la digitalisation de la documentation relative à la Première Guerre mondiale et de la salle de lecture digitale du ministère de la Défense de la République tchèque, qui est la plus grande ressource digitale sur le sujet, comptant 360 000 pages. Et il a également la responsabilité de la base de données sur les soldats morts et disparus des pays tchèques, Enfin, on peut dire qu'il est le maître d'œuvre avec Jaroslav Lahanik, c'est ça, de la série de cinq conférences sur les pays tchèques dans la Grande Guerre qui sont organisées depuis 2014 par l'Institut d'histoire militaire, dont la dernière d'ailleurs a eu lieu le mois dernier à Prague. Je pense que vous en étiez un, voilà, un, un, un contributeur. Voilà, je, je, on peut citer encore sa monographie sur la construction de l'armée tchécoslovaque entre 1918 et 1923, intitulée « L'armée tchécoslovaque dans les années d'édification et de stabilisation 1918-1932 paru en tchèque. » Voilà, euh, je vous laisse la parole. Euh, merci. Thank you, thank you very much for the introduction uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me here and um, um, most thanks belong to Etienne and his team who um, made a great exhibition uh, and um, uh, I'm very glad that I had this opportunity to, to take part uh, um, a little bit in, in this project, a wonderful project, and I hope you all will enjoy the exhibition um, in the next weeks. Um, Yeri was speaking about uh, the experience of the majority of uh, Czech soldiers uh, s serving in the Austro-Hungarian army, and uh, I will try to offer you an overview of uh, the activities of Czechoslovak legions, the, the minority, uh, but the army of the Czechoslovak re resistance movement. <clears throat> I will start with the France. Uh, Czech and Slovak compatriot communities could not compare in France, either in numbers or, in, or the influence to the largest ones in the USA and Russia. However, they managed to attract attention even before the outbreak of war and after its beginning by their outspoken radical position against Austria-Hungary. I would mention uh, the case, uh, the affair, uh, when, when there was a manifestation uh, there, <clears throat> which, which ended by, by burning a flag uh, torn down from, from the Austrian embassy. Uh, this was a provocation which caused many troubles for, in, in France. Uh, they perceived the war as an existential threat to the Czech nation and uh, as a unique opportunity for reaching state independence beyond the framework of the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, from the circle of par Parisian compatriot societies, Sokol, Falcon, and S socialist Rovnost, Egalite, 300 volunteers joined the army at the beginning of the war. They actively contributed to the fight against Germany and its allies as a part of the French Foreign Legion, in which they constituted purely Czech Nazdar Company. The conditions of the trench warfare on the Western Front left little chance for the unit's survival. Due to heavy losses, 
In the battles near Arras in May and June 1915, the Czech company ceased to exist. Moreover, the new French law, Berenger's law, prohibited further further rec recruitment. In France, where the Czechoslovak National Council had its headquarters and where it was most important to promote Czechoslovak military participation side by side with the Entente, the stage was being set for the creation of an auto autonomous army only during 1917. The effort culminated in December 1917, when a special presidential decree enabled the establishment of the autonomous Czechoslovak army in France. A burning lack of soldiers in France was solved by the transport of Czechoslovak volunteers from various corners of Europe and the USA. The ambitious plan to bring Czechoslovak legion from Russia to France failed with the exception of two relatively small groups counting 1,500 soldiers. In summer of 1918, Czechoslovak Rifle Brigade, composed of two rifle regiments, stood under arms on French soil. They went through their hardest and famous fights in October 1918 in the Battle of Vouziers. After formation of the 3rd Regiment in January 1919, the Rifle Division returned to Czechoslovakia and its regiments had to intervene immediately in the defense of integrity of the new state. Sorry, Russia where around 100,000 Czechs and Slovaks resided before the war, was, after the USA, the state with, with the second largest compatriot community. Many of, these, many of those who still had Austro-Hungarian citizenship found themselves at the crossroads after the declaration of war. Whoever did not obey the mobilization order from Austria-Hungary and decided to stay had to clearly demonstrate their loyalty to Russia. It was the Tsar's order from 2nd August 1914 on the deportation to Siberia uh, of, of the deportation on the deportation of enemy aliens to Siberia and confiscation of their property which evoked serious worries among the Czechs and Slovak comp compatriots. It encouraged manifestations, declarations of loyalty to the Russia and initiated a wave of requests for Russian citizenship. The strongest proof was the will to fight against the Habsburg monarchy and therefore compatriot organizations tried to establish Czechoslovak military units from the very beginning. The Czech Družina, a battalion-sized unit composed of compatriots, was formed as a part of the Tsarist army in Kiev on 28th of August 1914. The Russian command deployed it in parts on the front against Austria, against Austria Hungary to carry out recognizance tasks. During Carpathian winter campaign 1914-1915, these companies proved to be valuable eyes and ears of the Russian divisional commanders. In spring 1915, many of these volunteers anticipated the liberation of the homeland. What a great delusion! took over in their ranks after the surprising Russian retreat following the gorlice tarnov offensive in May 1915. In August 1916, the so-called Kiev Memorandum ensured that Czech and Slovak compatriots in Russia joined with the resistance movement abroad under the leadership of the Czechoslovak National Council. Before the spring of 1917, the Czech Drusina had grown in size and turned into the Czechoslovak Rifle Brigade. However, it continued to fight scattered over the front. Only the demoralization of the Russian army after the February Revolution of 1917 and the need for reliable units for the summer offensive offered the opportunity for the tactical employment of the whole Czechoslovak Brigade. Successful, it was a successful attack by the Czechoslovak Brigade <coughs> The, success, sorry, the successful attack by the Czechoslovak Rifle Brigade near Zborov on 2nd July 1917 received a significant positive reaction. The Czechoslovak Brigade was a rare island of reliability in the sea of the demoralized Russian army. Unrestricted recruitment of in prisoners of war camps was finally approved by the Russian provisional government.
and rapid increase in volunteers enabled to estab enabled the establishment of an army corps in the autumn 1917. After the Russian October Bolshevik Revolution, the conditions for further operations by Czechoslovak forces on the Eastern Front changed radically. As soon as the Soviet government commenced peace negotiations, any further presence of Czechoslovak forces in Russia lost its reason. Masaryk declared these troops to be part of the Czechoslovak Autonomous Army in France. He enforced its neutrality within within the Russia, within Russia, and he tried to secure the fast departure of the whole army to Vladivostok by railway, and then farther to France by ship, where it was supposed to continue fighting. However, the journey eastward was obstructed in the spring of 1918, when the transports of repatriated German and Austro-Hungarian prisoners of war were given priority by the Bolsheviks. In the tense atmosphere, a confrontation occurred between Czechoslovak units and the Soviets in Chelyabinsk, and quickly it grew into an armed conflict. The press all over the world was writing about the brave advance of the Czechoslovaks, who managed to gain control over the Transsiberian Railway from Volga River to Vladivostok within four months. Nevertheless, in the autumn 1918, the Czechoslovak forces were stricken by a severe moral crisis caused by complete exhaustion and unfulfilled expectations of support from other intent armies. They were withdrawn from the front line, and in the upcoming months, the Czechoslovak units focused on the protection of the Transsiberian Rail Railway. A gradual evacuation of the Czechoslovak troops from Russia started in January 1919, when the first ships, ship transports set sail, and it continued until November 1920. In Italy, there was no compatriot communi community before the war. That's why the preconditions for the establishment of resistance activities were much worse than in Russia, France or the USA. After the Italian front was opened in May 1915, captured Czechs and Slovaks were gathering in prisoner of war, prisoners of war camps scattered all over the country. In spite of this fact, their significant potential for the resistance movement remained unexploited. Only thanks to the decision to concentrate prisoners of war into camps on the basis of their nationality, a spontaneous effort by many Czech, Czech and Slovak POWs to participate in the fight for an independent state could slowly materialize. Nevertheless, the Italian government had little understanding of this initiative for a long time, and only the crisis after the defeat at Caporetto in autumn 1917 forced Italy to support Czechoslovak activities. Czechoslovak National Council had to wait for a groundbreaking agreement with the Italian government on the establishment of Czechoslovak army in Italy until April 1918. However, Italian commanders successfully used Czechs for recognizance much much earlier. Thus the first Czechoslovak recognizing detachments were established in September 1917 uh, beyond the framework of the official resistance movement. In the spring of 1918 four rifle regiments were formed by volunteers and as early as the middle of August the Czechoslovak rifle division was deployed on the front line between the Lake Garda and the Adige River where its men dis distinguished themselves particularly in the fighting for the summit of Dosso Alto. The legionaries in Italy formed the Czechoslovak Army Corps in October 1918. After its return to the homeland in December of the same year, the corps significantly contributed to the defense of Slovakia against Hungarian troops. I can't uh, omit uh, United States. Uh, where the potential for the support of the Czechoslovak resistance movement abroad uh, was uh, most uh, was really fa favorable. Almost one million Czechs and Slovaks resided there before the war. Most of them still kept deep emotional bonds 
with their roots, especially those new immigrants. Compatriot communities with significant cultural and social activities kept an eye on the events on the other side of the ocean. The declaration of war there therefore created great concern about the fate of the Slavic nations in the Austria-Hungary. Compatriot organizations immediately expressed not only their moral support, but also prepared material aid. Citation, now every politically conscious Czech, Czech works towards independence, independence for the lands of the Bohemian crown. Leaflets with this motto were distributed by the Czech American Committee for Independence and Support of the Czech Nation as early as August 1914. It also advocated raising money to support Czech independence and war-stricken compatriots in Europe. Czech and Slovak organizations in the USA agreed on joint action for the creation of the Czechoslovak state in the Cleveland Agreement in October 1915. Subsequently, the Czechoslovak National Alliance became the common central organization and its purpose was mainly to acquire funds for the Czechoslovak National Council as well as lead promotional activities. Later on, it also recruited volunteers for the Czechoslovak army in France. The main recruiting office was established in Stamford, Connecticut and first volunteers left for France in November 1917. Altogether, almost 3,000 men from the USA joined the, U the, the Czechoslovak troops. This was a relatively minor contribution. Crucial was the financial aid provided by Czechs and Slovaks from America to the Czechoslovak resistance movement. Uh, just to conclude, I would, I would say that um, uh, you, you could see how uh, what was the diversity of various branches uh, which were coming uh, to the Czechoslovakia after the war. It was a huge group of uh, Czechos of, of Czechs uh, uh, from s formerly form formerly serving with the Austro-Hungarian army. Three ma major branches of uh, Czechoslovak legions, and after the war, also the so-called Italian Domobrana. These were uh, soldiers captured by Italians and uh, then sent gradually to the. Czechoslovakia, and it was a great task for the for the new state to to unify its army. And uh, as we can see from the history of the Czechoslovak army in, in its uh, formative period, uh, it caused uh, really uh, serious troubles. Thank you for your attention. Merci pour ces interventions. Děkuji mi za příspěvky. <laughs> Et puis on va passer aux questions. Je voudrais, sans vouloir monopoliser la parole, poser une première question, peut-être pour lancer le, le, le débat. Je voudrais que Kétienne nous raconte, alors succinctement, mais clairement, comment il a préparé cette exposition, c'est-à-dire comment il a constitué les textes, choisi les photos, enfin, comment ça s'est passé, dans quel ordre. Voilà. Si vous voulez poser des questions ensuite, Ilona pourra éventuellement traduire vers le tchèque, si euh, oui, oui, éventuellement, elle peut le faire. <rire> Merci. Je n'étais pas préparé à cette question, mais en fait, évidemment, elle se pose. Euh, les choses se sont passées de manière, de manière assez simple, en fait, à partir du moment où où la direction de la Bulac m'a mis dans les mains efficaces de l'équipe de l'action culturelle. Les choses se sont faites de manière assez simple par des échanges réguliers, dans un premier temps assez, assez euh, éloignés les uns des autres. On a d'abord beaucoup travaillé sur les fonds, en fait, euh, sur ce qui était disponible dans les fonds et la manière dont on pouvait les mettre en valeur. Euh, on s'est vite rendu compte, malheureusement, que ce serait très difficile de les mettre en valeur sur les panneaux de l'exposition elle-même. Euh, même si on avait beaucoup travaillé sur, sur ce sujet là et c'est aussi pour ça qu'on a, euh, qu a travaillé après sur l'exposition au rez-de-jardin de la Bulac 
de choix d'un certain nombre euh, de ses ouvrages les plus, les plus anciens ou les plus, disons, significatifs pour tout ce qui a trait à l'action extérieure et à la propagande extérieure, parce que c'était plus difficile de le faire sur la partie intérieure, en fait, de ce qui se passait en pays tchèque. D'où le, le, le travail qui a été fait, plutôt de, re, de, 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 de reprendre en, ré, en, en rééquilibrant, je pense, en fait. Euh, je ne vais pas dire que j'ai pesé où est-ce qu'il y a le plus de tchèques, parce que ce n'est évidemment pas comme ça que ça se passe, mais bon, moi, je fais partie de la génération qui a mangé, euh, qui a mangé euh, de l'action extérieure, euh, euh, qui a vu les grands héros, Massaric, Benesch, les légionnaires, etc., et en fait, qui, qui a fini par se poser la question de savoir s'il n'y avait pas un peu plus de tchèques à l'intérieur des pays tchèques que dans les légions où ils étaient entre 10 000 et et 50 000 dans le meilleur des cas jusqu'à jusqu août 18, et, et donc de travailler beaucoup sur la, sur la, partie, sur la partie intérieure. Euh, et c'est là que sont intervenus Yerji et, et Tomash euh, pour la recherche de fonds à partir d'une trame, trame de texte et d'une trame thématique en fait, que j'avais déjà fixée. Et donc il a fallu qu'ils recherchent euh, qu recherche, euh, en fonction de mes ordres, en quelque sorte, ce qui pouvait correspondre et alimenter les panneaux. Et puis un des éléments importants, parce que malheureusement, donc, comme je l'ai dit, on avait dû renoncer à la, à la mise en valeur du fond de la Bulac sur l'exposition principale elle-même, c'était aussi de montrer à quel point ce fond est riche. En, vous, vous le verrez peut-être si vous ne l'avez pas déjà vu. Euh, la partie inférieure de chaque panneau euh, présente des références biographiques, pardon, bibliographiques euh, d'ouvrages qui sont disponibles à la Bulac et qui, pour chaque panneau, correspondent alors soit à des ouvrages vraiment absolument fondamentaux, parce qu'il y en a beaucoup, soit à des ouvrages d'une qualité ou d'une rareté particulière euh, et dont dispose euh, la Bulac, euh, et dont la Bulac pardon, dispose dans ses fonds. Voilà. Voilà, donc c'était aussi une manière de faire le lien, puisqu'évidemment l'ensemble a été porté par l'équipe de l'action culturelle jusqu'à la dernière seconde, et que moi en fait bah, j'ai écrit les textes et choisi les photos. <rire> voilà. <rire> bon, ce qui est déjà pas mal, mais c'était un travail. Euh, et je, 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 je profite de l'arrivée d'Emmanuel Garcia que j'ai vu arriver, mais que je vois plus, euh, qui est la graphiste, euh, pour la remercier une nouvelle fois de, de l'énorme travail qu'elle a fourni en très peu de temps pour que cette exposition puisse voir. Voilà, merci Emmanuel pour le travail fourni, euh, en, encore une fois en très peu de temps et, et dans des conditions difficiles mais agréables. Y a-t-il des questions Je peux un français et puis un anglais, hein, comme on veut. Ça m'est égal. En anglais, peut-être. Hein. Uh, it's actually a, a bit on the margins, uh, my, my question, but, but given what we were told about the uh, large number of Czechs and Slovaks in the United States, um, I was just wondering whether, with independence, because we know the situation that existed between Russia and Czechoslovakia and France and Czechoslovakia, um, the legionnaires in the case of um, Russia, the community here in France, which uh, sort of um, uh, was, was powerful despite its relatively small numbers. But I was just wondering whether in the enthusiasm of independence, was there any movement back to what was now Czechoslovakia f by these Czechs and Slovaks, was there an influx of Americans, American Czechs and Slovaks to the now independent uh, Czechoslovakia? And the second small question goes to the exhibition. Will there be a publication? I've taken some photographs of what one can see on the wall, but will there be a publication? That would be a very useful contribution if there were to be. Uh, but anyway, my question is about whether there was any influx of the community, the, the almost million strong which had gone there in the 19th century, back to their own country now that it had this different uh, status. 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I don't know uh, the situation uh, from the view of demographic uh, um, uh, numbers. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I mean c civilians uh, uh, going back uh, to the to the Czechoslovakia, but uh, uh, just from my experience, because we are just uh, working on. Uh, um, uh, making uh, card files of the French uh, Legion uh, online accessible, uh, and we 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 digitize all the cards, and, and as we are going through these fi these files, we can see many many uh, Slovaks uh, uh, re re residing in in the, in the USA. Uh, who who came back and lived in Slovakia? Uh, they came back with the uh, with, with the with the French legions, but uh, many Czech Czech uh, many soldiers uh, who who were um, who came from the, the Bohemian lands, uh, they they went back. Uh, mo large number of them uh, has a mark has a notice in their in their cart that, that they came back with the transport to they came back to to the United States but uh, uh, we we so far we we did not have opportunity to make a, um, a further analysis uh, because the, um, those who uh, went to live in in Slovakia could be young uh, men without commitments uh, for, for 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 them it was easy to to move and and those uh, older men who who were uh, well, who, who established their life in in the United States uh, logically wanted to get back to their family so um that's that's all I can yeah, say to it this. Was, it question. was on the margins, but it, I just wondered. Thank you. Thank you. Does it work? Oh, <laughs> I would just add uh, some. Just a speculation because I have no statistics or something, but I, I've been spending some time in. Uh, Working with the Czech American community in Nebraska, which was the largest uh, Czech American community, Czech American community after Chicago, and uh, as far as I remember, they uh, some of those people who came to Nebraska just before the war, uh, they were, but I would say there was just hundreds of them probably who after the First World War during 1920s moved back to Czechoslovakia. They were mostly, even before the war, they were mostly econ what we, we would call today economic migrants. So they basically brought, they earned money. And after Czechoslovakia was created, there was even kind of like, they didn't mind coming back with the money and starting their lives here, but mostly as far as I remember, you know, not probably not even thousands of them Came came back from this region. I have no idea about, but was probably similar in all the other uh, Czech American communities. So probably few thousand of them came back, uh, not necessarily immediately, but during 1920s. But it's it's a guess. I am not sure about. <laughs> Sur la question de la publication, rapidement. Euh, ça n'a pas encore été euh, évoqué. Enfin, disons, ça n'a pas encore été, enfin, ça été évoqué en aucune manière. Voilà. Mais je, je, je pas, en tout cas, pas en version papier. Après, il y a des formes euh, de mise en valeur par la Bulac de, de ce qui est réalisé dans le cadre de l'action culturelle. Donc, je suppose qu'il va se passer des choses intéressantes. Euh, voilà. Pour l'instant, c'est tout ce que je sais. Mais je sais que ça sera intéressant. Alors. Puisqu'il n'y a pas d'autres questions, euh, je vous propose euh, qu'on procède de la manière suivante. Euh, commencer par la visite commentée de l'exposition que certains d'entre vous ont déjà pu voir. Alors, étant donné le nombre important de panneaux, je pense que je vais présenter les panneaux plutôt par, euh, par grand 
chapitres finalement, il y a quatre grands chapitres, et puis chacun d'entre vous après sera évidemment libre de... de d'admirer l'un ou l'autre de, des panneaux euh, ou plusieurs panneaux euh, qui sait et puis ensuite dans un deuxième temps euh, je vous propose qu'on aille euh, à, au, au rez de jardin de la Bulac qui est fermé au public à partir de, de 20h et où sont exposés dans des vitrines un certain nombre d'ouvrages des, des fonds de la Bulac euh, avec, euh, pour lesquels je ferai également un certain nombre de, de commentaires qui sont des ouvrages euh, soit intéressant, soit joli, soit les deux, euh, rare. Voilà. Et donc euh, ceux d'entre vous qui le, qui le souhaiteront pourront également venir. Et puis ensuite, il y a un buffet qui aura été monté pour que ceux qui auront soif et faim, c'est-à-dire probablement euh, beaucoup d'entre nous, puissent échanger autour d'un verre et de quelques petits fours. Voilà. Merci beaucoup d'avoir été euh, présents. Je remercie euh, encore une fois euh, Yerji et Tomash pour euh, leur euh, part indispensable. Euh, à cette exposition puisque <rire> pas de photos, pas d'expo, c'est aussi bête que ça euh, et puis encore une fois Catherine pour, pour la section de Tchèque et, et Ilona et merci infiniment à la direction et à la direction scientifique de la Bulac de ce formidable cadeau de m'avoir permis de préparer cette exposition pour l'institution merci